Before we uh, start our song service, let's just bow down our heads forward and pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you once again for another Sabbath day that you have given to us to come and worship you. We pray that as we start our Sabbath school, we pray that you be with us and guide us and bless this program, oh Lord, in Jesus' name, amen. Our first song is hymn number 294, Power in the Blood. Would you be free from the burden of sin? There's power in the blood, power in the blood. Would you or evil a victory win? There's wonderful power in the blood. There is power, power, wonder-working power in the blood of the Lamb. Precious blood of the Lamb. Would you be free from your passion and pride? There's power in the blood, power in the blood. Come for a cleansing to Calvary's tide. There's wonderful power in the blood. There is power, power. In the blood of the Lamb, there is power, power, wonder-working power in the precious blood of the Lamb. Would you do service for Jesus, your King? There's power in the blood, power in the blood. Would you live daily his praises to sing this wonderful power in the blood? There is power, power, wonder-working power in the blood of the Lamb. There is power, power, wonder-working power in the precious blood of the Our next song is hymn number 633, When We All Get to Heaven. We'll be singing verses 1, 2, and 4. Right. 
was before us, soon his beauty will behold. Soon the pearly gates will open, we shall tread the streets of gold. When we all get to heaven, what a day of rejoicing that will be. When we all see Jesus, we'll sing and shout the victory. Wonderful words of words of life, hymn number two eight six. song is hymn number 614, Sound the Battle Cry. Christ is 
is captain of the mighty throng. Strong to meet the foe, marching on we go, while our course we know must prevail. Shield and banner bright, gleaming in the light, battling for the right we make and fail. Cross and soldiers rally round the banner, ready, steady, pass the word along. Onward, forward, shout the loud Hosanna. Christ is captain of the mighty throne. O thou God of all, hear us when we call. Help us one and all by thy grace. When the battle's done and the victory won, may we wear the crown before thy Bones and soldiers rally round the banner, ready, steady, pass the word along. Onward, forward, shout a lot of sadness, Christ is captain of the mighty. For those who are able, could we kneel? Our Father, which art in heaven, we are so thankful, Lord, once again to have the privilege to come and worship you in the house of praise. Even though it's been cold this week and we're going into winter, we thank the Lord for the warm clothing that you've given us and the roof over our heads. We pray, Lord, that you'll be with those that are less fortunate than us as well, Lord. We can see that the church is still a little bit empty. But please give traveling mercies to those that are still in their way. Many are getting old now, Lord, and they can't travel to church. So they in their homes or in their little rooms. We pray, Lord, that you <coughs> touch him in a special way, bless him this Sabbath. There are those, Lord, who are ill. We have many members in our church who are very ill at the moment, Lord. We pray that you'll be with those whose names are in the bulletin. You know in each, each one's ailments, Lord. So we pray that you'll be with them, comfort them in a special way. I also want to thank you, Lord, for seeing Brother bull in church this morning we pray lord that you'll carry on blessing him and heal him lord to health and strength lord we pray that you'll be with our children as well lord who are very important lord because one day they will be the servants of your house as they grow older lord bless the teachers that are teaching them the right way lord and that they might be a blessing to to us and Lord, we also want to ask you, Lord, to be with Sister Anna Marie as she leads out this morning, Lord. <coughs> we know, Lord, that whenever we prepare something, we know that you always have an input, Lord, and the words that will come out of her mouth will be what you want us to hear, and it might be a blessing to us. Be, Lord, with those that are also praising you around the world. We pray, Lord, that you will bless each and every one of us be with us Lord one day as we look forward to your coming that we might all gather in the clouds of heaven to see you be Lord with those that are going through turmoil in Europe we pray Lord that you'll be with them and comfort those people that are going through hard times in the war be with our country as well in a very special way Lord we also have our problems be with the leaders Lord that they might have wisdom to do what is right we ask you, Lord, to bless us, 
this beautiful Sabbath day. So ask in thy name. Amen. everyone <coughs> it is a wonderful morning and uh, I think we need to be so privileged that we can worship our Lord freely um, coming to church without any issues so can we open with the hymn 326 please thank you <laughs> this morning there won't be a mission story but there will be a, a video and I hope it's a blessing to you thank you the Aleutian Islands getting ready to leave and go back to Anchorage and then home and I had a ticket in my pocket to get on an airplane and a pastor came up and he said listen I can save you money I said how's that he said I flew a small airplane up here and I fly a small airplane and I can take you in my little airplane and you can save your ticket. And this did not sound, I said, gee, thank you so very, very much. But I've got this ticket. We'll just make our way on home, me and this other lawyer with me. He said, no, 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 you gotta do it, you gotta do it. And against every better judgment I had, I said, okay. Well, we went out to the airport, took us by his little plane and I looked at it and I thought, 
Well, one good thing, it's shiny. Then he walked around it. We got in. He's on the left front. I'm on the right front. The other lawyer's sitting right behind me. And he started it up. And it started up just fine. Well, we taxied out. I said, should we pray? He said, yeah, that's a good idea. We normally don't. I said, well, this time we're going <laughs> to. And I'm telling you, I prayed five, eight minutes. I prayed a long time. We went and got on the runway. He starts down the runway. The plane lifted off ever so gently, and we start climbing. And it's wonderful. Not a problem in the world. We started climbing, and we flew probably three, four minutes. And something happened that will never leave my mind. The pilot turned to me and he said, we're going in the clouds and I can't fly in clouds. They make me pass out. I said, clouds make you do what? <laughs> now it's been cloudy all day. And we go right up into the clouds and you can't see anything. And he looks at me and his eyes roll back in his head and he starts mumbling and he passes out passed out cold. Now I grabbed him and I shook him and I said, come on, you got to wake up so I can kill you. Now we're in the clouds flying along with no pilot. And my friend in the back seat said, we're dead, aren't we? I said, there's a very good chance of that. Yes. He said, what are we going to do? I said, I don't know. But there was a radio right there and I handed him the microphone and I said, start asking for help. So he's in the back seat reaching up and he said, hello, hello. We didn't know any proper radio etiquette. All we were saying was hello. And somebody answered back, hello, hello. Don't you guys know proper radio etiquette? And I said, give it to me. I said, tell them, we don't know nothing. Tell them we're in an airplane with a passed out pilot and we don't know how to fly this plane. The guy said, I'm a freighter flying out of Anchorage on the way to Tokyo. And he said, you're telling me you have nobody who can fly that plane with you? I said, tell them that's correct. Now you gotta understand, I am sweating bullets. He said, the first thing I'm gonna do is start circling so I don't lose you because I'll fly out of range of your radio and you won't have me anymore. And he said, I'm gonna get Anchorage Emergency for you. And Anchorage Emergency will be the people that can maybe help you try to save your life. After about five minutes, Anchorage came on, said, we understand you have a passed out pilot. And those of you do not know how to fly that plane. We said, that's right. They said, well, the first thing we gotta do is find you. And I'll never forget what this man at Anchorage said. He said, my job is to get you home safe. He said, that's my job. But he said, here's the deal. If you want me to get you home safe, you gotta promise me you'll obey my voice. He said, you can't see me, but I can see you. And he said, if you're not gonna obey my voice, you're gonna die. When you can't see anything, you have no idea how disorientated you become. Finally, he said, okay, I found you. Now hear me clear. He said, you're four minutes from a mountain. He said, you're gonna crash in that mountain and die. Follow my voice. I never said, I have to follow your voice? Is that reasonable? You see, I understood without his voice, I had nothing. And do you understand? Without God's voice, you have nothing. Nothing. Finally, he got us turned. And he said, I'm freezing all the traffic in the area. He said, it's going to take me an hour and a half to get you to Anchorage. And there's a lot of weather between you and Anchorage. You're in for a rough ride. And he said, I want you to hear me. I don't want you to look at what's going on outside. I don't want you to pay attention to the storm, just my voice. He said, if you start watching the storm, you will die, but I'll take you through it. Now, because they cleared all the traffic, several pilots, those nighttime freighters, those 747 started talking to us. They said, we're praying for you, men. You're going to make it, but listen to the voice. That's the key. They said, trust the voice. Do you realize your head is full of voices and everybody in this world wants to talk to you and everybody wants to be the controlling voice? And God says, I want you to be a living sacrifice. I want you to put yourself on the altar and let my voice be your voice. Finally, we went through the worst of the weather, but there was still more. And then the voice came back and he said, now, I'm gonna line you up. He said, I'm gonna bring you in right down the runway. And at the foot of the runway are some lights and they're in the form of a cross. He said, don't you forget this. The cross is the way home. Finally, he's bringing us down. We still can't see anything. 
And all he kept saying is, stay with me. My sheep, the Bible says, hear my voice and they follow me. Finally, just a couple hundred feet off the ground, we saw the cross. I landed the plane. In fact, I landed it seven times. Finally, it all came to a stop, and the minute we stopped, the pilot woke up. The voice said, thanks for listening. I watch them crash and burn all the time because they won't follow my voice. They don't understand I'm the one who can see them even when they can't see me. But they get the voices in their head, and they kill themselves. They self-destruct. Thanks for listening to the voice. Then they put us in a motel room at about four in the morning, a knock at my door. And I opened the door and a man was standing there. He said, hello, David. He said, you're the voice. You're the one who got me home. He said, I am. Do you understand one day you're gonna stand before him and say, you were the voice. You're the voice that brought me home. If you're not on that altar as a living sacrifice, your head's full of voices. And then we wonder why kids crash and burn. We wonder why marriages are shattered. And the Lord's saying, I'm the one who has the voice. All I can remember is that voice saying, stay with me. Stay with me. Don't listen to what's going on in your head and don't watch the storm. Stay with me. And I'll take you through. Tonight you have a God who has promised to take you through. A living sacrifice, holy. Can I ask the deacons and deaconesses to come and um, take the offering? Let's just bow our heads. Dear Lord, we want to thank you that we can come to your house again, Lord. Dear Lord, we know that the small offering that we bring to you, Lord, you can multiply it, Lord, to further your work, Lord. There's so much work that needs to be done before the end times, Lord. But Lord, we ask that you take the little that we've given. Pass in mighty name. Amen.
just going to read you something <coughs> it was written by Gary Brulin. It says, running well and finishing strong. And it's based on 2 Timothy 4, verse 6 to 8. It says, I am at my best nearing the finish of a race. Until then, I'm just another mediocre distance runner, just one of the many run-of-the-mill competitors well back in the pack. Just one more old man trying to string together six-minute miles and not quite succeeding. But with the finish line in sight, all that changes. Now I am the equal of anyone. I am world class. I am unbeatable, gray-haired and balding and starting to wrinkle, but world class, gasping and wheezing and groaning, but unbeatable. So writes Dr. George Sheehan in his book, running and being. An accomplished cardiologist, author and marathon runner, George Sheehan lived his life with passion and purpose. Even when confronted with terminal cancer in 1991, he demonstrated courage and determination. He ran life's race and he finished strong. As with Dr. Sheehan, the day will come for each of us to finish life race. In 2 Timothy 4, we read how that time had come for Paul. In fewer than 100 words, he shares with us the hardships of the present, the heartbeat of his past, and the hope he holds for the future. In this brief passage, Paul reflects on his life and ministry. He looks around, looks back, and he looks ahead. With the finish line in sight as he picks up the pace, Paul sums up his dynamic life and his hope in death. The lessons we learn from this aging apostle will enable us to run well today while encouraging us to finish strong tomorrow. Paul's words are dedica dedicated probably to Luke shortly before his martyrdom at the decree of the Roman Emperor Nero in the year 66 AD. For 30 years he has traveled, witnessed, worked and preached throughout the Mediterranean world. He has been helped and hated, assisted and attacked, blessed and cursed. Whatever else can be said of his faith and life, it certainly wasn't dull. Enduring imprisonment and anticipating his execution, Paul begins in verse 6 with two vivid metaphors telling us about the hardship of the present. First, Paul sees himself as a drink offering, about to be poured out. What is the apostle saying? In ancient Rome, in ancient Rome, Banquets commonly ended with a particular ritual, the symbolic act of pouring out on the ground a cup of wine in honor of the Roman gods. Here Paul borrows this image. He says that his life is an offering poured out of the Lord Jesus Christ. Of course, this fits with Paul's belief that all of life is to come under the Lordship of Christ. All of life is to be regarded as a living sacrifice Holy, ex holy, acceptable to God, as Paul writes in Romans 12. In effect, the apostle is saying, the Roman authorities will not take my life. Rather, I will die living my life, giving my life for the Lord. I have been a living sacrifice, serving him since the day I was saved. Now I will complete that sacrifice by, s by laying down my life for the one who gave his life for me. Second, in Romans 12, verse 6, Paul also relates that the hardship he is facing will soon cease, and he writes, the time has come for my departure. The word departure is a word that has many meanings. For one thing, it can mean to hoist an anchor and set sail. It seems that Paul looked upon his present hardships and his impending death as a release from the world. Paul saw death as an opportunity to set sail into eternity. Another meaning for the word departure refers to striking and taking down a tent. The apostle longed to be freed from his battered and broken body, his earthly tent now shackled in prison. He anticipates his martyrdom as a change of place and a journey home. As he told the Philippian Christians, to live is Christ, to die is gain. Paul awaits his release from his present hardships in order to depart and to be with the Lord. At the same time, Paul affirms God's sovereignty over life and death. He trusts in a personal and a compassionate Savior and Lord who will not place on him a burden greater than he with the Lord will be able to bear. 
rather than wrest control from God, rather than alleviate his brief present hardship and suffering by taking his own life, Paul reaffirms his confidence in God's will and way. In this way, Paul is determined to wait upon the Lord. In 2 Timothy 4 verse 6, the apostle looks around at the present hardships. He looks back on his life. He remembers the heartbeat of his past. For over 30 years, he has faithfully served the Lord. In this verse, we find three images drawn from the athletic arena. Paul likens his life and ministry to that of a long-distance runner who has completed honorably in the ancient Olympic Games. I fought the good fight. The word fight in the original text comes from a word which may refer to any athletic context in the Games. The phrase carries a much broader meaning than we commonly associate with a fight or a boxing match. The word is agon, from which we derive our English word agony. It pictures an athlete coming off the field, having given it its all and its best. Here Paul is truthfully saying that he has given his all for Christ. I have run the race. I've given the best. Paul now sees himself as crossing that finish line. It is easy to begin a race. It is easy to run hard for a few miles but it is much harder to finish a long distance race and harder still to finish strong. I believe that Paul is telling Timothy and each one of us that the Christian life is not a sprint competition. Rather, it is a long distance race, a marathon type challenge beckoning us to run well, to keep pace, to stay focused and to finish strong. Years before, before Paul stated his life purpose in John 20 verse 24, I consider my life worth nothing to me if only I may finish the race and complete the task the Lord Jesus has given me, the task of testifying to the gospel of God's grace. Here in 2 Timothy 4, Paul looks back and he is able to say, I have run the race to the finish. Then the apostle concludes his look back on his life by stating, I have kept the faith. If we understand this statement in the context of the ancient Olympic Games, Paul is telling us that he has run the race according to the rules. History reveals that the early Greek and Roman athletes took a solemn oath before the games. They pledged that they would compete honestly and honorably. Here is Paul at the end of the race confirming that his vows have been kept. And to whom were these vows made? To his Lord. Paul is saying that throughout the long, lonely, difficult and demanding race, He's, he has kept Christ uppermost in his heart and mind. His life goal for 30 years has been to be obedient to Christ's call. His faith, though tested, has grown stronger. And the Lord Jesus, in whom Paul has trusted and for whom Paul has lived, has kept and carried Paul through thick and, sorry, thick and thin. The Lord's grace is sufficient for every, every need. In 2 Timothy 4 verse 7, Paul looks back on his life, remembering the heartbeat of his past. Then finally, in 2 Timothy 4 verse 8, the aging apostle looks ahead and writes about his hope for the future. Now there is in store for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day, and not only to me, but also to all who have longed for his appearing. In the ancient Olympic Games, a winning athlete was awarded with a coveted royal wreath or a garland of oak leaves. With this, the victor was crowned. To wear such a crown was the greatest honor that could come to any athlete. But this crown, in a few short days, would wither. Paul knows that there is for him a crown which would never fade, and this crown of righteousness is God's reward to those who are faithful and obedient to his Son. As Paul writes to Timothy, he knows that in every short time he will stand before the Roman judgment seat and that his trial will have but one outcome. He knows that Nero verd verd what Nero verdict, verdict will be. The judges in Rome were not righteous. If they were, they would have released Paul. How many times had he been tried in one court after another, yet now he faces his last judge, the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, the righteous judge who always judges correctly. William Barclay once observed that a person who is dedicated to Christ is ultimately indifferent to the verdict of any human court. He cares not if they condemn him so long as he hears his master's voice saying, well done, 
good and faithful servant. This is Paul's hope and joy as his life nears its end. He looks ahead with confidence and certainty. He shares his joy with Timothy, reminding his young friend that this crown awaits not only him, but also Timothy and all others who trust, serve, and live for Christ. Consider your own life. Do you have the same kind of hope and assurance? You may feel pressed and pressured on every side. The challenges at times may seem relentless. You may feel a lot like Paul must have felt. Yet, do you have the hope and assurance which he knew and his death neared, as his death neared? Whether your race has just begun, is reaching the midpoint or is nearing the finish, you can have the peace of God in your life and you can be at peace with God. And the only way how is to do what Paul did. He confessed his sin and admitted his need for God's forgiveness. He accepted God's love and accepted God's Son, Jesus Christ, as the Savior and Lord of his life. That is what Paul did, and that is what each of us must do. Only with the Lord will we be able to run life's race to the very best of our ability, and only with the Lord will we be able to finish strong. The story of Eric Liddell, the 1924 Olympic 400-meter gold medalist, is widely known through the 1981 Academy Award-winning film, Chariots of Fire. Little, the son of a Scotch Scottish missionary to China, he himself became a missionary serving Christ in China. Like Paul, Eric Little was imprisoned and died for his faith and witness for Christ. Like Paul, he also was committed to run for God and let the whole world stand in wonder. As you and I run the race set before us today and tomorrow, Time, take time to reflect on your running. Remember Paul's word to Timothy. Realize that with the Lord, you too can fight the fight, run the race, and keep the faith. With the Lord, you can run well and finish strong. Can we end with the hymn 518, please? <laughs>
It's just close. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for this wonderful opportunity. Thank you that we can praise you on this holy day. Lord, we just pray that our worship to you will be acceptable to you today. And we just ask that you fill us with your light and your love so that we can shine your light. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning, Sabbath School. We are definitely happy and blessed to be here in the house of the Lord. And before we start our lesson, can we just bow our heads? Thank you, dear Jesus. Then we can come and, wo and worship you. We thank you, then, your Holy Spirit is among your God's people. And we thank you for your presence in Jesus' name. Amen. Today we continue with the story of Jacob, Saga of Jacob. I don't know how many of you were here last week, but we learned some interesting tidbits. The first one, then Jacob was 77 years old when he had to run for his life. Did you realize that? He was an old man in our understanding he would be probably in the old age home, sitting and watching TV, doing nothing. So you can imagine these people had vitality, virality. They had so much more health than we have today. They were much stronger. And we also learned that while he ran for his life before his brother Esau, he went to his uncle Laban and how many years he worked for his wives? 14 years. So he was 77, 14 years, and he worked. How many people go on pension already at the age of 60 and never worked again? Just think about it. He worked, and he worked very hard. And we also learned that he was deceived. Jacob, deceiver, supplanter, Usurper was deceived by his uncle Laban. And I mention that our perception of Leah is very wrong. Most of the people always think of her together with Laban because she was, uh, you can say, together with Laban in that deception. But did you realize then Leah bore Jacob six sons, and we know then it was Reuben, Simeon, Levi, and Judah. From which branch comes Jesus Christ? Judah. You know, we never think about it. It wasn't from Rachel, the beloved wife of Jacob, when we have the seed which was the savior, it was from Leah. 
And I just want to read this because I had this wrong perception, and I think most of you also. Leah must have, must have been a very pure woman. How do you call religious woman? A devoted wife and faithful mother. She mentioned the name of Jehovah in connection with the birth of three of her first four sons. Although she came from a very idolatrous family, she accepted the religion of Jacob and became sincere believer in Jehovah. In contrast, Rachel's conversions was very superficial. While outwardly she too accepted Jacob's religion, her heart remained attached to the old family idols. Do you remember that story? Many people skip it and don't actually think about it. And Leah, you know, also in sharp contrast to Leah, Rachel was much more selfish and care about herself more than the others. Isn't it that interesting tidbits? And Leah's fourth son caused Leah to exclaim, now will I praise Jehovah, as if she knew by intuition that he would be the ancestor of the king of Israel and of the Messiah. Thus she called him Judah, the praised one. Isn't it wonderful to see in a bit different light Leah? And um, by the way, we continue with the Jacob story. I just wanted to add it because I didn't finish it last week. There was just no time. And now we continue with Jacob, and I call it dysfunctional family. First of all, he married two sisters. Did you think about it? Two sisters. Was that allowed? No, it was called bigamy. In fact, in the Moses law, you can check this, Leviticus 18, verse 18, it was forbidden. You couldn't concurrently marry two sisters. Of course, Moses law wasn't given yet. That's why we have this example how dysfunctional family can be. Secondly, we have polygamy, right? More than one wife, but not only that. As you remember, when Jacob got married, each of the Leah and Rachel got their maiden servant, Bil Bilha and Zilpha, okay? And as we read, they also become mothers, okay, of the future 12 tribes of Israel. And they all included in that, you know? I mean, how that sounds for the good start of so-called Israel. I thought, that's crazy. I mean, shouldn't be a holy, peculiar, special people? There's nothing holy about it, is it? it? No. And yet God overlooked their mistakes and errors, not because he condoned it, but he still worked his will in what was happening in the life of this people. That's to be was revelation, because we, just like them, also sinners in a need of a savior. So Jacob, how many years he served with Laban? 20 years. After 20 years, so let's do the maths. How old he was now? 97? 97. Who is 97 here? Anybody? 97? We don't even have 97. I think Brother Thomas, you are? <laughs> there we go, 97. Okay, and he actually gets a call, a direct command, now you must go back to the land of your father. Was Laban happy about it? No, of course not. But Jacob saw 
then his, you know how you call it, I don't know how you call it in English, but Laban's sons were getting very jealous. They were getting actually very angry with Jacob because his wealth increased, his family, his household was becoming bigger than this. So they were looking and they were ready to literally steal from whatever he had. So God, in the right time, he says, okay, now is the time, Jacob, you better go back to your land. Also, as an interesting fact, remember, Isaac is still alive. In fact, Abraham lived up to 175, Isaac to 180, Jacob to 147, before I forget that. So they were all long living patriarchs. So Jacob sets, you know, back to his land. And we know his first encounter with the angel of God was when he was running away. And he called this place Bethel, the house of God. That's where he saw the angels ascending and descending, remember, on the ladder. And that's where God gave him assurance, I will be with you. I will bless you. I will protect you. Okay? Now he's coming back, and he is very, very worried. We know then he stole by deception his brother's birthright. And we talked about what the birthright actually consists of. In other words, he would get twice as much of the worldly, you know, like properties, cattle, and everything, but also the spiritual aspect, which Esau was not interested at all. He was interested only in material things, in properties, wives, kettles. He was wild, adventurous man. So Jacob is setting out. Now he is not anymore alone, only with the stuff, remember? When he ran, he ran with nothing. Now he has how many sons? How many sons? Jacob is now leaving Haram on his way back to Canaan. How many sons? He already has 11 sons. Okay, so remember, Joseph was already born, you know, when he was still with Laban, okay? The last son will be born on the way to Canaan, and that's where Rachel dies during the childbirth. Also, I don't know how this happened, but somehow Deborah, okay, was sent by Rebecca to Jacob. Because we read, then he also, she dies first, and he buries her. That was his last link, you know, with his mother. That was the nurse which basically brought Jacob up. He will never see his mother again, but he will see his father. In fact, he will stay with his father until the point when even Joseph is sold to the slavery. Remember, the Bible often is not written chronologically. You know, certain things happen already, and it's only written much later, you know, in the chapters of the Bible. But we're coming to the main point of Jacob's life. And I think we all will have to come to that point in our lives. When he started... Like I said, he was extremely worried. So he divided his camps. Remember that? He has wives, he has children, different ages. And remember, he was a shepherd. He wasn't a warrior. Where, in contrast, Esau was a warrior. He was the one who was fighting. 
So he divide his camps, you know. In case the first one, something happens, the other two at least have a chance to run away. And look at his strategy, okay? And I was reading this, and my first thing was, is he still leaning on his own strength? Doesn't he trust God? After all, God said, you must go back. Now he's doing all this, you know, tactics. But I think that's what we can call prudency. I think by now Jacob's learned to trust God. He was a change man. You know why he went? Actually, he sent them over the Jabok River, right? And then he wanted to be alone. He wanted to spend that night, you know, in prayer. But before that happened, remember when he set up on the journey and he reached the borders, we can call it of Canaan, he had the place, it's called Mahanaim, Mahanaim, which is translated double camp or double host. And that is to me so wonderful. When he set up on his journey, the Lord already set up the protection for Jacob. In fact, it's called double host. I prefer this because it was two double bands of angels, one advancing before him and one following him behind. Doesn't that sound familiar? Where do we see exactly the same thing? When the children of Israel left Egypt, the pillar of fire during the night and the cloud during the day. That we know, it was the bands of angels. And he has that presence of the angels following in front and behind him. So the Lord never leaves Jacob. He advances before him. So now angelic host brought assurance of divine help because he was dreading the meeting with Esau. So that was something which he needed. He needed encouragement. He needed to go forward. And back to Jacob's tactic. When he sends the first band, very clever, he says to his servants, tell Esau, thy servant Jacob is greeting you. Do you think Esau forgot what happened between him and his brother? No. He actually wanted to kill him, by the way, and he would have that 20 years ago. And of course, you know, now Jacob wants to make sure that Esau understands, I'm not coming to take your inheritance. Because remember, the prophecy said, you will rule over your older brother. And Isaac gave blessing to Jacob. In other words, he was the rightful owner of that inheritance. So now to make sure, Jacob actually is very clever. He says, I'm your servant. And he sends with gifts, a lot of cattle and sheep. Look, I'm not poor. I'm not coming to take your wealth, your goods, your land. I'm coming here with peace. And that shows you also the difference between the two brothers. Jacob really only cared about the spiritual aspect of his birthright. And I think that was the biggest difference between these two brothers. He really cared that he will become the progenitor of the seed. I won't be able to hear you, uh, brother, right? But yeah.
like I said, you know, because my hearing, I can't hear at all, but I hope you all could hear what Brother Wright was saying. Um, a Jacob needs to be alone. He needs to now spend a night in prayer. He is not certain of what. What is his biggest worry? What is his biggest worry? Is Esau his biggest worry with 400 armed men? Then he's going to be killed, destroyed. What is his biggest worry? Why he's going to spend the whole night in prayer? Remember this event. It's precursor, what we call Adventist, a Jacob's trouble. And I think from the lesson, this is probably the major part, which I think it's the most important, because that reflects what's going to happen at the end of time. So what was the biggest worry of Jacob? Then his sin was not forgiven. That, that deception which he used to trick his brother all these years was heavily weighed on his conscience. And now he wanted to make sure that that sin is forgiven. So he is actually wrestling in prayer for forgiveness. And then, of course, somebody touches him. He thinks it's an enemy. He struggles. But then he realized it's supernatural being. It's not just a human. And he exclaimed, Peniel, in other words, I've seen God face to face and I'm alive. He wouldn't be alive if his confession wasn't sincere. He wouldn't be alive if his repentance wasn't true. He would be dead. And I, I want to ask you a question. How many of you have a book, Patriarch and Prophets? Can I see the hand? Anna Marie, quite a few. How many, the great controversy? Please, those who don't, do yourself a favor and obtain these books. It's a such an insight which is giving us to the story. Because Jacob's trouble is going to be repeated. And the question is now, when Jacob's trouble will start? Who can answer me? When Jacob's trouble will start? We have often talk about it. We know the term, Jacob's trouble. We know the story of Jacob, but when this is going to happen. I want to open you, I want you to open the Hosea 12 and 4, which refers to actually Jacob. And we know our memory verse is then your name shall no longer be Jacob, but Israel, because you wrestle with God and you prevail. So basically, you become a victor, and you become a changed man, right? In the past, Jacob relied on his own wisdom and strength, but now he learned to trust wholly in God. Hosea 12 verse 4 confirms this. Let's just read it. He took his brother by the heel in the womb, 
and in his strength, he struggled with God. Yes, he struggled with the angel and prevailed. He wept and sought favor from him. He found him in battle, and there he spoke to us. That is the Lord God of hosts. The Lord is his memorial. So with whom he was fighting, wrestling, he was fighting with God. In fact, from Patriarch and Prophets, we learn that it was Jesus Christ himself. And now the Jacob's trouble, when is going to start? It started with Jacob when Satan instigate Esau to go against Jacob to kill him, to destroy him. Yes? That's what was in the heart of Esau. In fact, while Jacob was struggling with God, another angel, well, was sent to Esau. And basically only God could change the heart of Esau. And God protected Jacob, and we know the story. They actually end up kissing each other and making good, right? But how does that relate to the end of time? When is the Jacob trouble starting? I want you to think about the festivals which Israel nation had. The whole year of Israel festivals is showing us the whole centuries of Christian era, right? And we as an Adventist, in which festival we are living now, if I can put it that way. We know then Passover being fulfilled, right? Which festival we are living now? Come on, Adventists. This is the backbone of our doctrines. If you don't know what's happening, then yes. But I want here, you must come here, I hope. Otherwise, I can't hear the answer. Sorry, I, I'm totally deaf. Even have a mic. Hope. Atonement. That's it. We are living most, in most the hope. day of atonement. And this is exactly what's happening. You know, do you remember the month of Tishri? The first, it was the trumpets. They were going to sound for 10 days. And what the Israel supposed to do? They supposed to examine confess all the sins, right, before they could actually come to that festival of the Day of Atonement. In fact, the Bible says if you don't do it, you will be cut off. And cut off, it means you will be destroyed, killed. And on the 15th of Tishri, the Day of Atonement happened, which only happened once a year, right? Where Jesus okay, where high priests on earth entered the most holy place, okay, that was only once a year, where the sanctuary was cleansed and the sin was taken away from the sanctuary and put on Azazel. Do you know this story? Do you know your doctrine of atonement? And then it was destroyed, right? So we see in Jacob what's happening. He is in that agonizing moment. He is examining himself. He's asking God for forgiveness. He is repenting because God is coming. So the day of atonement, we are living in the time when Jesus will finish his ministry. Remember, in 1844, that ministry started. In 1844, how many years is that? And do you know what was the last festival? It was the tabernacles, which only happened five days after the 15th of Tishri. 
Okay, we can calculate this the way you want it. But the main thing is it's very short time. The Lord is coming. The time of Jacob's trouble is basically here. Because when we read the spirit of prophecy, when Jesus leaves his robes and walks out of the sanctuary, we read in Revelation, who is clean, let him be clean. Who is righteous, let him be righteous. There is no more grace, there is no more probation. The probation is closed. And that's where the Jacob's trouble is starting. The people of God will be on its own. Even though there is a promise, the Spirit of God, he will never leave his people. But it will leave the world. Do you know that? That angels who are holding the winds of strife will let go. And the fury of God will be let. Before that, it's the Satan fury. There will be no law on this earth to protect you. You will be in a direct conflict with the prince of darkness. There will be no civil war which will actually give you any justice. The law will actually go out to kill those who keep the commandments of God and hold to the faith of Jesus. And that's where the Jacob's trouble, where the people will be searching and examining did I confess my sins? You know, Jesus doesn't hate a sinner, but he hates a sin. That's why when we read, Esau I hate, Jacob I love, some people say, you see, God is not God of love. They read it wrongly. Jesus, God loved Esau as much as he loved Jacob, but he hates sin. And because Esau cling to the sin, he cherished the sin, he was rejected. And the same is going to happen at the end of time. The law will not protect you because the death penalty will go forth. And the God's people are not going to be worried about the death. They will be worried. Do I'm standing in front of God forgiven, like Jacob did in his night of Jacob's trouble. So I think we need to realize the time of Jesus' ministry is finishing. We know that. Any time. In fact, if we read the spirit of prophecy, that time was prolonged for the sake that many more can be saved. But are we sincere? Are we truthful as Jacob was? His sin were forgiven. I didn't even come to the Dina story and Reuben's story, but I just want to tell you, then Reuben, who was the firstborn, he lost his inheritance. Same goes for Simon and Levi. They didn't get the inheritance. Judah did. And from Judah's line, we have the Messiah, our Savior. And therefore, Jacob's trouble, I really uh, encourage you to read two chapters from the great controversy and from the Patriarch and Prophets. There are two chapters which will give you the full picture what's going to happen. Great controversy states very clearly there will be such time of trouble as never before. And if you think normally your imagination is worse, you know, you imagine things always worse than they are, it won't be the case in the time of trouble. Armageddon, time of trouble, goes hand in hand. I would say actually it's the same event because that's where the forces of evil will go against God's people. And are we ready? Let's end up with prayer. Dear Jesus, we thank you so much that you give us warning through the Bible, your word, and the spirit of prophecy. Let us hold on to our faith and let us repent. Let us for confess our sin and seek your forgiveness in the blood of Jesus is our only hope. Amen.
Welcome to our Divine Hour of Worship. To continue with our song service, let's sing hymn number 369, Bringing in the Sheaves. Hymn number 369. Let's sing, sing hymn number 474. Take the name of Jesus with you. Verses 1, 2, and 3. Oh, how 
sweet home of earth and joy of them precious name oh how sweet home of earth and joy of them oh the precious name of Jesus how it thrills our souls with joy when his loving arms receive us and his songs are times and more precious name oh how sweet oh my birth and joy of him precious name oh how sweet Burdens are lifted at Calvary. Hymn number 476. Blessed Sabbath to each one of you and uh, welcome to the regular members that are always here. You know, I always say the seats might be cold, but the heart is warm. We need to keep our hearts pumping all the time. Um, for the visitors that are here sharing the day with us, I pray that you will receive the blessing that you came for and may the love of the Lord touch you in a special way. I've got a few announcements to bring to you. Okay, the first one is communion next week. So get, let's get our hearts prepared for communion. If we just have a small little grudge against somebody else, you know, one phone call away, 
and say, you know, Harvey, can I come and visit you if I've got something against Harvey so that we can make up, so that we can embrace and say, we are the children of God. Nothing that, nothing that I have with Harvey. I just, I was looking at him and uh, I mentioned his name. But I still love you, Harvey. And I love everybody. Yeah, that is preparation for our communion. You know, let's get our hearts ready. We can't go to heaven holding a grudge because then you may as well sit here. Um, there's the prayer request. I can't even read through it because uh, it's increasing and increasing. And I just spoke to Brother Mark and what his, his uh, little sermon is all about. It's even going to increase more after he he's sp uh, spoke to us. So, yes, it's, uh, I think prayers is a very important part of our lives and we need to go on our knees. I just mentioned the fact that, uh, you know, in today's world, when you've got a free time, go on your knees. And if you've got another two minutes free, go on your knees because it's, prayer is never enough. Also, there's uh, member transfer. And I'm gonna, this is the first reading, so we're not going to vote on it, but uh, next week we will vote. Okay, the first is the voting or transfers into the church. And that is uh, brother and, uh, Craig De Brain and sister Janine De Brain. They're coming from Secunda to Bassonia. Then there's two families out, which is Pastor Dion Hager and Claudie Hager from Bassonia to Silverleaf in the Western Cape. And also the same with Guillaume and uh, uh, Tanya Kutsia from Bassonia to Liverleaf, uh, Silverleaf in uh, Western Cape. So this is the first reading. We will be voting next week. When I mentioned pray, pray, and pray, a general conference is starting the session on the 6th, a couple of days' time. And you know, if they fail, we all fail. Because that is the head of the church. If our organization starts failing at the top, then somewhere it like sort of comes down. So we need to pray and pray hard for God's guidance, the Holy Spirit to overtake that convention center where they are meeting together. It's uh, pastors, presidents from all over the world where they meet. And uh, I think they even have 24 hour prayer rooms there for the Holy Spirit to touch the people that uh, need to be guided in the new offices that they need to elect in this uh, new five-year term of our conference. So yes, I'll ask you that if you've got two minutes, even if you have to meditate, ask the Lord's guidance to be there and to protect the general conference session. Also, our speaker for today will be Brother Mark Adams. And as we go through the back, may you have a silent prayer for Mark as he's prepared the message for us. Thank you and have a lovely week.
Father, which art in heaven, Lord, we find ourselves in your holy place this morning, coming to seek thy will and to speak to our Father, which is in heaven. Lord, as we go through this divine hour, may the Holy Spirit be present, and Lord, may our worship be acceptable before your throne, is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Our scripture reading for this morning is taken from the book of Psalms, and I'll be reading the very first chapter of the book of Psalms, Psalms chapter 1. Now, I invite you to turn with me in your Bible, in the scriptures that you have in front of you, as we read this psalm together. Psalm chapter 1. I have a new King James translation that you will receive a blessing from the translation that you have with you as well. The word says to us, Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the path of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law he meditates, Day and night. He shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that brings forth its fruit in its season, whose leaf also shall not wither, and whatever he does shall prosper. The ungodly are not so, but are like the chaff which the wind drives away. Therefore, the ungodly shall not stand in judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, by the way of the ungodly, shall perish. May the Lord add a blessing to the reading of his word. Sing the wondrous love of Jesus, sing His mercy and His grace. In the mansions, bright and blessed, He'll prepare for us a place. When we all get to heaven, what a day of rejoicing that will be. When we all see Jesus, we'll sing and shout the victory. While we walk the pilgrim pathway, clouds will overspread the sky. But when traveling days are over, not a shadow, not a sign. Rejoicing that will be when we all see Jesus, we'll sing and shout the victory. Let us then be true and faithful, 
Just in serving every day, just one glimpse of Him in glory, with the toils of life we pay. When we all get to heaven, what a day of rejoicing that will be! When we all the victory onward to the prize before us soon his beauty will be old soon the pearly gates will open we shall trail the streets of gold when we all get to heaven what a day of rejoicing that will be when we all see Jesus, we'll sing and shout the victory. For those who are able, let's kneel as we seek the Lord in prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we kneel before you this day, Lord, because it is a special day where you put it aside for us to come together, Lord, and worship you. It is so, for, so rejoiceful, Lord, that we can meet each other and worship your throne, Lord, where the love of our Father loves us so much that the Holy Spirit that dwells amongst us, our Comforter, and the love of our Lord Jesus Christ, who paid the penalty on the cross on our behalf, be full, full of grace and mercy that He wants us to go home and enjoy the wonderful eternity that He's preparing for each one of us. Father in heaven, we can't thank you enough, Lord, Minute by minute, whenever we think about you, Lord, you can only rejoice in your love that you have for each one of us. But, Lord, we also come short of your throne, Lord, and we pray that you are the potter and we are the clay, Lord. Remold us, Lord, wherever we go wrong, remold us to the character that you want us to be so that we can follow the footsteps of our Lord Jesus Christ. Father in heaven, there are many that are not to our Lord. We see in our bulletin, Lord, that the list is just increasing, Lord. There are so many, Lord, that sometimes we don't even know them, Lord. It can be friends. But, Lord, we pray that you will touch these people, Lord. Touch them in a special way. Comfort them, Lord, so that they can feel the warmth of your love. Father in heaven, we also pray for our youth and our children. Lord, touch them in a special way, Lord. You know that sometimes it's hard out there, even at the children's schools, the way that education is being taught, Lord. Sometimes it's not Christian-like. May we ask, Lord, that you will be with the parents, that their ears will be open and listen to the, what the little ones bring home, Lord, and correct the little ones so that they live and grow in your statues, Lord. Father in heaven, I, we pray as well for families, Lord. You know that sometimes it's not easy losing your jobs and uh, pressure of life. That we ask you, Lord, to be with the, in the presence of our families as well, Lord. There are so many hardships out there, Lord, that we ask you to be with, within us, Lord, that you can always feel that the love of Jesus is always there for us. We pray, Lord, as well for Brother Mark Adams as he's prepared the message for us, that you will touch him, and that we may get the blessing that we came here for, Lord. May you touch him, may you touch his family. Strengthen him, Lord. Let him be the strong pillar in your house, Lord. 
But I don't ask for him, Lord. I ask for everyone that sits here in the pew, in the pews of your house, Lord, and even out there in the world, Lord, that you will strengthen each one of us, that we don't let go of your love, Lord. In a special way, Lord, we pray as well for the general conference session. It's going to start now on the 6th, Lord. And we pray, Lord, that, you, that your Holy Spirit will be there, minute by minute, that you will guide our leaders, Lord, to serve you. It's a time of trouble that's starting, Lord, but we ask you, Lord, to be there present and to guide our leaders in the future of your work, Lord. Father in heaven, we don't deserve these sins. We are sinful nature, and you know, Lord. But through the precious blood of our Lord Jesus Christ, we want to say we are sorry. Forgive us, for we ask it in the wonderful name of Jesus. the deacons please come forward let us bow our heads for the offering of the titan offerings heavenly father you have blessed us lord with health and strength and you want to return to you lord what belongs to you the tithe and from the depths of our hearts lord we want to bring the offering our offering lord that we pray that it will multiply and multiply again, Lord, that your work may be finished soon, Lord. There are so many people, so many children out there that still don't know about you. And we pray, Lord, that these, this money will be used so that your coming may be soon. We ask these things only in the wonderful name of Jesus. Amen.
Sweet hour of prayer, sweet hour of prayer that calls me from a world of care and bids me at my father's throne. Make all my words and wishes in seasons of distress and grief, my soul has often found relief. And all this came, the tempter snares, by thy return, sweet hour of Sweet hour of prayer, sweet hour of prayer, thy wings shall my petition bear to him who's true and faithfulness and gaze the way to soul to and since he bids me seek his face, believe his word and trust his grace, I'll cast on him my every care and wait for thee, sweet Sweet hour of prayer, sweet hour of prayer, may I thy consolation share, till from our prison's lofty high, my view, my hope. Child, while passing through the air, farewell, farewell, sweet hour of prayer. <clears throat> Good morning and welcome to everyone to Bessonia Church once more as we've come to the Lord's house to the sweet hour of prayer. As I look across the congregation this morning, I'm glad to see Sister Jean. She had COVID and she was ill for a while and I'm glad to see that you're back and we continue to pray for your family and Michelle as well. I'm also glad to see Merrick this morning. He was in Warsaw last week. And he went to the Warsaw Church and he took Bessonia's regards to the, the church all the way across in the northern hemisphere in Poland where they are on the borders of this great war that we read about. And we're glad to, that Brother Merrick is back with us again this morning. And we pray for Brother Wojtek and his wife, Sister Yola. They will be traveling to Poland this week and they'll be away for a month. And may the Lord keep them in his hand as he travel as, a, as they travel um, all the way across the world before we start let us bow our heads and ask the lord to be with us as we study his word our father which art in heaven lord we thank you that we can be here together this morning we thank you for the promise that where two or three are gathered that you are present lord we thank you 
that we have this channel of communication called prayer where we can speak to you and Lord you hear us instantly you even know our thoughts before we open our mouths thank you Lord and may we be drawn closer to you these are prayer in Jesus name Amen this week um, during the course of my work one of the projects I was asked to assist with was for a another church here in Brackenhurst where they have a, a stormwater problem where they've just built a new building over a stormwater servitude. And so I was called in to assist with um, getting this around the municipality and diverting the stormwater pipe. And so as I went to a meeting this week to meet with the, the manager of the roads and stormwater department from this region, he happened to be late and for 45 minutes I was able to stand and speak to the pastor of, of this church, Pastor Hannes van Sale, and a good God-fearing man and we were able to speak many things. And we, one of the things that we spoke about was how lockdown has affected our church as Bessonia and he was able to share with me how lockdown has affected their church. They also noticed that there are many people that have grown cold, people that haven't come back to church. But then we got onto the topic that some people have also realized the times that we are living in and that we are close to the end. And then he brought up, he says, but you are an Adventist and don't you believe in the signs of the times and that's your, one of your um, focuses that you have. And so I said to him, yes, that's why we have the name Adventists because we believe that Jesus is coming soon and that we need to tell the world of the signs that are right before our eyes. And so he was telling me the name of his church, which is Revival City, and he was talking about revival. And as he was talking about that, it made me to start to think, where do we stand in revival in our own hearts? If you think about where we stand at the point in time where we are now. Is there anything special about this weekend? Can anybody think of something special? And although we don't believe in keeping the feasts and festivals, I remember as a child we used to remember Ascension Day. Do you remember Ascension Day? That passed last week Thursday, the um, 24th I think it was of May. And where we stand today um, this would be the time of the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. And um, it would be the Feast of Weeks, as we now are seven weeks after the resurrection of Christ. And at this time was a time when the Holy Spirit was poured out upon the disciples. And, and the, after spending much time in prayer, the Holy Spirit was poured out upon them. And isn't that our desire, that the Holy Spirit is poured out upon us? Particularly as we look into this week to come, we know that our church leaders being the general conference will be meeting. And as they choose new leaders and plot the way forward, let us spend time in prayer. That it's not men that will be choosing these leaders, but it will be the Lord. And will be choosing people that are prepared to work for Him so that the Lord's coming may be hastened and we may be used as instruments in that time. And so, as I consider how do we start this process of, of the Holy Spirit being poured out to us, the whole process of revival and revival in our own hearts. And friends, the only way that that can begin is when we spend earnest time in prayer and praying for one another. Do you know that as we read through the Gospels, we can see that Jesus spent many, many hours in prayer. In fact, we can read that Jesus always said grace before he fed the many thousands of people. At the Last Supper, he prayed. At the Supper at Emmaus, Jesus prayed. We know that Jesus prayed in the early hours of the morning, and often he'd be found praying at night. 
and way into the late hours of the night. Jesus was busy, but yet Jesus made time for prayer. Has anybody ever regretted spending too much time in prayer? I think even the person who prays the most on, the, on this earth does not regret that they've spent too much time in prayer. We can never spend too much time praying to the Lord and speaking to Him and telling Him of our wants, of our trials and our tribulations. Time in prayer is of utmost importance to every single person, no matter who you are. This morning I want us to look at um, the book of Matthew. And here Jesus teaches us about prayer. And if you turn with me there to Matthew chapter 6. And here we learn about what Jesus says about praying. This morning in the prayer warrior group we were talking about prayer as well and, and how we must be careful how we come across when we are praying for people. And so I want to share with you what, what Jesus said. And I'll be reading from Matthew chapter 6, starting at verse 5 down to verse 8. And it says, And when you pray, you shall not be like, be like the hypocrites, for they love to pray standing in the synagogue and on the corners of the street, and they may even so they may be seen by men. Assuredly, I say to you, they have received their reward. But you, when you pray, go into your room, and when you have shut the door, pray to your Father who is in the secret place, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you openly. And when you pray, do not use vain repetitions as the heathens do, for they think that they will be heard for their many words. Therefore, do not be like them, for your Father knows the things that you need of before you even ask. Did you get those important things? The important things about even us as Christians and when we pray. earnest desire to be speaking to our Lord is your motivation to be meaningful is it a motivation to be meaning what you're saying as you speak to your father an important quotation that I came across says, says as, as follows the great people of the earth today are the the people who pray. I do not mean those who talk about prayer, but I mean those who, those people who take time to pray. It must not be taken from something else. The something else is important, so it must be taken from something else because something else is important and a very important and pressing, but still less important and less pressing than prayer itself. Friends, when we stop to pray, when we spend time in prayer, we are taking time away from something else. But that something else is not as important as time to pray. Martin Luther um, says as follows, he says, If I fail to spend two hours in prayer each morning, the devil gets the victory through the day. I have so much business, I cannot get, get on without spending three hours daily in prayer. Do you see what he says? I can't get through my work if I don't spend three hours a day in prayer. And that's precisely the opposite of what most of us think. We think that we don't have time to pray because we have commitments to meet. And yet, Martin Luther considers prayer one of the important aspects or, or part of his business as he goes through his day. How much time do we spend in prayer 
and where does it fit onto our priority list? As we think about how we pray, have you ever considered and looked how people in the Old Testament, for example, Moses prayed? Have you noticed that he was seen by others as he'd pray, and he'd pray out aloud? Have you ever considered to pray out aloud? Well, if you find that your mind drifts, and often that is the case, try praying out aloud. Some people might think it's strange, but if we can take that time and pray out aloud, let us not be shy and let us speak the way to the Lord as we speak to our family and to our friends. Another important aspect, and we can find this in the model prayer, and what is the, the structure of our prayer? One way to summarize the, the model of a structure of prayer is to use the method of ACTS. And that's A-C-T-S, which stands for adoration, confession, thanksgiving, and supplication. As we read through the Lord's Prayer, we can find that this model follows what, how the Lord taught us, where he says, Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. So let us remember that when we pray. When we kneel down and pray, do we start with just asking the Lord? Or do we start with that method that Jesus taught us? Do we start with praising God for who he is, the adoration part? Do we prepare our hearts by asking God to forgive us of our sins? We aren't worthy of asking the Lord for anything. And so we need to confess and humble ourselves before the Lord. Most of all, do we give thanks for what the Lord has done in answered prayer? So often we have that list of wants and needs. And when the Lord answers that prayer, we forget to thank Him for what He has done. And then, lastly, we can lay our burdens and our, and our hearts open before the Lord as He can hear our problems and our needs and our prayers. Another way we can pray, and I remember this as a child. Have you ever prayed a psalms? I remember as a child we'd often kneel together as a family and we'd pray Psalms 23. And so we'd learn that as a family and we'd recite that as a prayer. Try remembering Psalms and pray a Psalms. It does our minds good. Another aspect of prayer, when we find so many difficult times and places to pray, how, how many hours do we spend in our motor cars? You know, as I look on the new modern motor cars, you have that, like a timer that tells you how long your trip has been. And you have another one that tells you, since it was reset, how long it's been. And if you consider the hours that you spend in your car, what do you do in our cars? Do you listen to the radio? Do you listen to some other music? But imagine if we could spend that amount of time speaking to the Lord, speaking loudly as we speak to our Father in heaven. Let us find that time and let us pray together. Friends, it's important that we make prayer a priority in our hearts and in our lives. When we start, perhaps it's just five minutes a day, moving on to 10, 15 minutes. But as that communication grows with our Lord, let it grow day by day that we can know that we've been with the Lord. Let us grow in that and let us be prepared for the Holy Spirit to be poured out in our hearts. This morning I've asked Brother Harvey if he'll give us a song this morning and how long has it really been since you've spoken to the Lord?
it be since you talked with the Lord and told him your heart's hidden secrets? How long since you've prayed? How long since you've stayed on your knees till the light? Shone through. How long has it been since your mind felt at ease? How long since your heart knew no burden? Can you call him your friend? How Since you knew that he cared for you, how long has it been since you knelt by your bed and prayed to the Lord up in heaven? How since you knew that he'd answer you and would keep you the long night through. How long has it been since you woke with the dawn and felt that Since you knew that he cared for you, since you knew that he cared for you, Sister White says in the Testimonies for the Church, volume 4, page 535, the core of religion. Religion must begin with emptying and purifying the heart and must be nurtured by daily prayer. Our role model for prayer. There are more than 30 references in prayer in Acts. If we, are, we as Christians are looking for a role model for prayer, there is no better example than the early followers of Jesus in the book of Acts. In Acts, we see four key features of the early church and prayer. The early church prayed dependently. Jesus told his disciples to go from Jerusalem to the remotest parts of the world as his witnesses. If 12 apostles and 100 or so disciples are going to reach the world, they had better get busy. But the first thing they do when Jesus ascends back to heaven is lock themselves up in a room, shut themselves off from everything and pray for 10 days for the power of the Holy Spirit. They understood that they needed supernatural power for a superhuman work. The most important lesson we can ever learn about prayer is that we can absolutely depend we are absolutely dependent on God. Jesus tells us in John 15 verse 5, apart from me, you can do nothing. The tricky part is that we can do lots of things on our own,
but the impact and fruit of our work is nothing unless Jesus empowers us. Psalm 123 verse 2 says, As the eyes of a slave look to the hand of their master, so our eyes look to the Lord our God till he shows us mercy. A slave is completely dependent on his master, and that's where we stand in our need for the Lord. Thurman Thomas was the leading Russian in the AFC in 1991 and helped to lead the Buffalo Bulls to the Super Bowl that year. But on the very first play of the Super Bowl, Thomas wasn't even on the field because he had lost his helmet in the pre-game warm-ups. A football player wouldn't dream of going onto the field without his helmet. And we as Christians shouldn't think of facing life or doing ministry without prayer, underlying everything we do. Jim Simbala reminds us God is attracted to weakness. He can resist those who humbly and honestly admit how desperately they need him. Our weakness, in fact, makes room for his power. The early church prayed corporately. A man once told me that he didn't believe in prayer meetings because Jesus told his disciples to pray in their closets. In Acts 1 verse 4, the disciples didn't go their own way and pray for the Holy Spirit to come down. They all joined together in prayer. Acts 2 tells us that they met daily in their homes and were devoted to prayer. They gathered at the temple and later in the synagogues at the regular times of prayer, not just as a testimony to their Jewish neighbors, but because they needed those times together for their own survival. The early church prayed powerfully. When the early church prayed, powerful things happened. Jesus told his disciples that their prayers could move mountains. We never see mountains moving in Acts, but we do see a couple of buildings shaken on their foundations. In Acts 4, the disciples get their first real taste of persecution. When the authorities commanded them to stop preaching, the church started praying. Acts 4 verse 31 gives us a series of calls and effect statements about what happened when they prayed. They prayed and the building was shaken. They prayed and they were filled with the Holy Spirit. They were filled with the Spirit and they preached the gospel with even great power. If we had a building move at one of our prayer meetings, we would either have a lot more or a lot less people at the next meeting. Incredibly, Acts 4 is not the only place in the book where prayer is more powerful than a building. Paul and Silas are having a midnight prayer meeting in the prison at Philippi that starts an earthquake that shook open the cell doors. There are more than a dozen times in Acts where it tells us that people were amazed in awe or in fear of what God was doing in and through his church. Outsiders were afraid of getting too close to the followers <coughs> sorry, of the way because they didn't know what God was going to do next. Outsiders today are more likely to yawn and stretch and when they think of what goes on in the church, but the power to leave even unbelievers amazed at what God is doing is still there if we ask for it. The early church prayed imperfectly. This final point of the message may seem anticlimactic, but it may be the most important thing we talk about today. There is a great reminder in Acts 12 that God not only answers praise, he answers imperfect praise. We tend to idealize the early church in Acts, but as a well-kept secret, the first Christians were not perfect. They argued over whose, whose win, uh, widows got the better food service and whom to take or not to take to their mission trips. They fell asleep in church windows and were distracted by the weightly issues of circumcision and kosher foods. Their faith wasn't perfect either. You have to admire that the disciples were committed enough to have an all-night prayer 
meeting for Peter's release from prison. But the reaction when their prayers are answered is priceless. Rhoda, the slave girl, reports that Peter is at the front door and their response is, you've lost your mind. They can't commute that God might have actually done the very thing they were asking for. They were devoted enough to pray all night, but doubting enough to not believe that their prayers would really make a difference. We pray that way all the time, believing one moment and doubting the next. Let me give you a challenge. If you have enough faith to pray and there is nothing left over to believe that God will answer, then pray anyway and see if God does something to surprise you. We don't need time, tra time travel to back to the first century to become the people that God wants us to be, but we do need to learn to pray like the early church. When we follow the examples in prayer, God will work powerfully, even when our prayers are less than perfect. Thanks. Thank you, Sister Raquel. Friends, as we look through the bulletin and we see the names of people within our own congregation that are sick, there are people in our own congregation that has desperate needs. We know that we are not going through easy times. There's health issues, financial issues, family issues. And so this morning I'd like to ask us all to stand in a circle and if you have a special prayer request, perhaps you can just very briefly, in 10, 15 seconds, mention if you'd like a special prayer request. And so I invite you, let us stand in a circle and ask everyone to stand in a big circle that goes all the way around the back and that we can pray together. Names and I'll just mention it again once more. Remember that we have Brother Ernest Prinsloo. He often attends church with his son at Mayerton Church, but we keep him in our prayers. Remember the Nordia family. We haven't seen them in this congregation for many years. And they have their own challenges. Brother Ernest has illness and his wife who is looking after him. We also think of my own dad. We're glad that he's here. And the Lord has blessed him in many ways. Remember Sister Jenny Uckers. Her and Brother Sydney haven't been here for a while. She was in hospital with illness. And so we continue to think of her. Remember Sister Dorothy Skull. She hasn't been in this church for so many years. But she has cancer. And we pray that the Lord will grant her healing. We're also glad that Brother Arthur Groliska is here. And we pray that the Lord will be with him his health and give him strength once more. We're also grateful that Brother Bill Casperson is with us. He's had also a difficult past few weeks with COVID, an operation, and we pray that the Lord will continue to strengthen him. We also think of Brother Eric from Merlin that's playing our piano, and he gave his testimony two weeks ago in Sabbath school of how the Lord was with him. Um, he still has much pain. He was due to go for tests this week, and um, that wasn't able to happen because of further problems, and we pray that the Lord will be with him and grant him strength. We also think of Sister Rachel Wright. Um, she had a, a terrible fall last um, Friday. She cracked a rib and has stitches in her forehead, 
And so we, got, we pray for healing for her as well. We're glad that Sister Ham is back with us, but we pray that the Lord will be with her family and be with them in a special way. We think of the Skitter family. None of us, or they haven't been attending to this church, but they are busy going through Bible studies with Brother Emmanuel and Brother Charles. And we pray that the Holy Spirit will work with each one of them. Is there anybody else who'd like to add a special prayer request briefly? We also have Brother Emmanuel's aunt. Sorry, um, Sister Ellen. Um, we often have seen Sister Marlene that attends this church and her mother, um, she suddenly had bleeding on the brain and we prayed for her and the operation was a success. But in the course of the operation, it was found out that she has stage four cancer in the brain and in the lungs. And that her lady's name is Ellen. And let us remember her in our prayers as well. Okay. I mentioned on the microphone. Sorry, brother. I've just mentioned it. Okay. Uh, also, I under the daughter of Peter, Peter and Stella Nkata. She is in hospital. I think uh, yesterday she went um, under a machine that scanned the brain. I don't know the name of the disease, what she's suffering from, but um, yesterday we, I spoke to Peter Nkata. He said they were going under, I mean, she, she was going to to that machine, so the result will come, I think, uh, later. But I haven't spoken to, to him this morning. But uh, let's also pray for, for her. Spoken prayer request, Sister Lynn. I'd like to pray for my daughter, Beverly. Um, she has major emotional problems, psychological problems. And um, she's lost her husband and she's lost another person that was in her life. And she's actually not doing too very well. If you can just keep her in your prayers, it's been quite a while that she's been this way. Let us remember Sister Beverly um, and keep her in our prayers. You know, sometimes we've got a physical illness, but when there's a, a mental illness, it's, it's a terrible illness to have as well. And if you're under stress, it doesn't help. Is there any further spoken request? Johan has a friend, uh, a work colleague, and he's in hospital. He's got blood clots in his lungs and in his legs. And then they gave him blood thinners, and now he's got bleeding on the brain, and he's not doing well at all. His name, no, his name is Murphy. Let us remember that name as well. I've asked for prayer for my, my nephew's daughter. Uh, her name is on the list, Taylene. And she's 12 years old and she's going for open heart surgery on the 6th of July. Uh, they are not Adventists, but her dad asked me to put her name on the list, prayer list. Thank you. Thank you for that name as well. Is there any other further spoken prayer requests that we have this morning? I know you prayed for my family, but listen, I'm worried about my daughter. I know she's still lost. She was never like that before. But she's got this terrible pain behind her eyeball. She comes home early in the daytime. She can't get through her work. Pain, and I sit every day with her with a bean bag. I, please God have mercy on her, bring her back to us again. I know you'll save her. I've got all my faith and trust in you. In Jesus' name. Is that, is that Sister Carol or Michelle? Carol. We'll remember Carol in our prayers as well. Any other spoken request? And then those who have an unspoken request can raise your hand and 
I think what's also important is every single one of us has a special need. Even if we haven't spoken the request, if we haven't raised our hand, perhaps we need more prayer than anyone else. And friends, let us pray for the families in this congregation. Let us pray for one another that Satan won't be destroying our families. And let us keep one another in prayer. When we see that somebody is not with us, and let us all be diligent to pray for one another, that we can be there and stand together as a family. I'm going to ask Brother Manny if he will pray for us this morning. I think before we close our eyes, I still want to highlight a few more that that's been in the bulletin, and that is families that uh, have lost loved ones. And also, you know, I'm not, when I pray, I'm not going to pray in individually, but uh, as uh, all, I think the Lord heard our concerns, but uh, there are those that uh, loved ones that uh, were here before, uh, some of them are our own children, that our uh, hearts cry for the Lord to bring them back. That's also very important. Those that are going through tough times in life, you know, sometimes we think that we are comfortable the way we live in. The Lord is blessing us. But what about those that are having hardships, you know, just to be fed daily? Those are heavy burdens upon our families. Also very special one is a general conference. You know, if we fail as a church, we may as well fail as a whole. And uh, we need to pray for our general conference. Make sure that the, the, the Holy Spirit guides them. But when I say the Holy Spirit, our own church. If we fail, yeah, we fail as a, as a congregation. So let's think about them in, in the, as we come past this week that we remember all these people. I think uh, I'll, may I ask a request, Mark, that we put it in the, in the church uh, group that in the next two weeks we put all these names down and we don't want to have a prayer. Let's open up. You can pray with open eyes. There's nothing wrong with open eyes because you're reading the name and the one that you are concerned of. So yes, there's a few names that uh, that uh, comes to our hearts. Let's bow our heads. Father in heaven, how great you are, Lord. A God that loves us so much. A God that is so merciful upon us. A God that wants to take us home. You are the almighty God that we serve. There's no one like you, Lord. Although sometimes we say that we have other little gods, they don't exist. We can put that in our hearts, but they don't exist, for they are dead gods. And therefore, Lord, we want to bring you and into our hearts, Lord, and say, what a wonderful God we serve. Father in heaven, before we, I bring to you the names and the, that you heard, Lord, we want to surrender our hearts to you, Lord. The shortcomings that we falter before you, Lord, we want to say, Lord, forgive us. Forgive us for our sins. We cannot thank you enough, Lord, the penalty that you have taken upon your body, Lord, on the cross. But it wasn't the pain, Lord. It was the rejection that we reject you on that cross. And we want to come to you, Lord, this morning and say, Lord Jesus, forgive us. Forgive us that we put you through that pain, through that rejection, that you felt from each one of us from the sins, Lord. We want to surrender to you, Lord, our hearts this morning, Lord. And we want to bring to you, Lord, the names that was read, the names that was mentioned, Lord. 
I don't know, Lord, if, if it's hardships at home, if it's the health, Lord, whatever motive it is, Lord, maybe pain that we don't see our children in church anymore, whatever motive it is, Lord, touch these, special, these people, Lord, with a special love that we cannot give it, Lord, but that only the love of our God. May the Holy Spirit pour out His Spirit upon us this morning, Lord, that we can finish your work, Lord. It's not an easy work, Lord, but it's so easy to say, Jesus loves you. And if we just spread the word that Jesus loves us, may your will be fulfilled, Lord, in this world. Once again, Lord, we give honor and glory to you for your work that for your work that you have poured upon each one of us. And as we go out now, Lord, in this week to come, may we come whoever we come across to, Lord, may we just say, Jesus loves you. It's not easy, Lord. To face the world out there. But we know that if we hold on to your hand, the obstacles will be so much easier. Father in heaven, we ask you to touch the people, to touch us, to touch our hearts, and convert us, Lord, if nothing else to the character of our Lord Jesus Christ. We ask these things, Lord. We don't deserve them. No, we don't, Lord. But through the love of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has paid the penalty on the cross on our behalf, we can say, in his name, we can ask it. Amen. This is a song for us. is praying for you someone is praying for you so when it seems you're all alone and your heart will break in two Remember someone is praying for you. Have the crowds round you gathered in the midst of the storm? Is your ship tossed and battered? Are you weary and warm? Don't lose hope, someone's praying for you this very day. And peace be still, 
is already on the way. Someone is praying for you. Someone is praying for you. So when it seems you're all alone and your heart will break in two, remember someone is praying for you. When it seems that you prayed till your strength is all gone and your tears fall like raindrops all the day long he cares and he knows just how much you can bear he'll speak your name Someone in prayer. Those who know the song, you can join me. Someone is praying for you. Someone is praying for you. So when it seems you're all alone and your heart will break in two, remember someone is praying for you. Someone is praying for you. So when it seems you're all alone and your heart will break in two, remember someone is praying for you. So when it seems you're all alone and your heart to remember someone is praying for you thank you brother Emmanuel in closing I'd just like to ask if anybody would like to be else would like to be added to the prayer list send me a a WhatsApp, and by let's call it by the end of tomorrow, we'll have gathered all those names, and then we'll put it on the church group that we can all pray for one another. There's a few other names that I failed to mention. We need to pray for Sister Carol Pinar. We haven't seen her for a long time. She's battling with her legs. We think of Sister Sparrow that hasn't been. She's frail and hasn't been able to attend church. And we also think of Sister Veronice Els, our welfare leader, who has troubles with her eyes. She can't drive at the moment, and we need to pray for her. We need to pray for Sister Hester Charles. Um, she came this morning to prayer warriors with a request for her brother-in-law, who subsequently passed away, and she has gone home. So let us pray for one another, and let us bear one another up to the Lord in prayer. Before we sing our benediction, let us bow our heads once more. Our Father which art in heaven, Lord, thank you for hearing our prayers this morning. We pray that we will stand by one another. And Lord, we pray that you will grant healing and grant wisdom. And Lord, we pray that you will grant strength to each one. Lord, may we remain faithful to you and keep us in your hand so that when you return on the clouds of heaven, 
that this circle won't be broken, but each one of us will be there together with our families that aren't here today. Is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.